good morning, everyone. Uh, it is 9.30, so these hearings are, are now resumed. Um, I'll introduce myself briefly. I'm Paul Griffiths. I've, I've met some of you this week, not all of you. My colleague, who you can also see on screen, is Simon Barclay. Um, there's only a few few points I want to make before we, we get on with things. I'm going to deal with things matter by matter and hear from the Member of Parliament first. Um, I would prefer it if um, only the speakers have cameras and microphones off. Everyone else can cameras off, microphones off. It just makes the whole thing run a lot easier with bandwidth. That's OK. So I'm not I'm not going to um, speak for very long. Ms Maskell, I'll hear from you first. Thank you, Mr Griffiths and um, Mr Buckley. Um, I really thank you for the opportunity for being able to provide uh, some support for today's inquiry in representing the residents of York Central and, of course, the land in scope in, in this inquiry. I want to ensure that York has a robust local plan which facilitates economic opportunities, sustainability and addresses the real challenges we're facing around economic space and housing for the future, as well as protecting our natural environment. I appreciate that planning law is about to change. However, I want to not only secure a local plan which serves our city well, but also um, reaches those ambitions that we've got for the future of the people of York. Since the last public inquiry, significant change has taken place. We've had Brexit, COVID, uh, Ukraine, and um, therefore many of the assumptions being placed within the plan are now out of date and need revising and certainly impact on the economy, on transport, on housing, and the urgency of the climate challenge ahead of us. Leveling up is the new ambition of government, yet inequality is growing and, and growing in York. And I want to ensure that as we're looking at a new leveling up and regeneration bill, just awaiting its second reading that we're able to address these factors. I therefore want to set out a bit of a, a, a vision and some, some challenge into the local context and um, particularly around, first of all, the language of sustainability to ensure that um, it is robust in the plan. I feel the evidence currently is weak to provide sustainable conurbations which are well connected with sustainable levels of transport and also to ensure that we have that economic integration which is so needed together with wider infrastructure. Instead, I fear that we could end up with greater inequality, that we could see more carbon being burnt and also um, the power for economic opportunity that York presents will not be realised. And therefore, this is, seems to be uh, the wrong plan for the wrong time, often with um, the wrong places being utilised. And therefore, I want to put forward some proposals to strengthen the plan and ensure that it works and holds together, which I feel it doesn't currently. Determining the land use and maximising the economic opportunity and housing benefit to meet government guidance is of prime importance. And I want to ensure that those opportunities are held for the future and, um, and therefore ensuring that um, the infrastructure is there to support as well, particularly looking at transport, schools and other healthcare developments. And therefore ensuring that political motivations aren't driving this, but the planning um, guidance is, is leading this and, and ensuring that we're not locking in a green belt, which is then going to have to be revisited in a short amount of time with the cries that we need to look at this plan again. So I want this plan ultimately to be sustainable in itself. And what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing within the plan, there is a, a heavy focus on packing in those brownfield sites, often choking off green opportunity and economic opportunity in the city centre with a heavy housing piece. And then this is out the opportunity for sustainable infrastructure. <coughs> Excuse me, places a, an emphasis on, on car dependency in the transport system and um, not utilising new modes of transport. With regards to the economic opportunity, in particular, I wanted to focus on this. The, the power of York Railway Station means that we are one of the best connected places there are. And therefore, to build the economic plan around that connectivity is important, rather than just locating sites on the suburbs of York. 
ensuring that as York City Council does not have a current economic plan, that we take advantage of the, the work that has been done by University of York, York Howard, um, Higher, the LEP and others in, in um, this emerging plan, which is happening around new cabinet office jobs, opportunity of government departments like DEFA moving on, on to central location sites, Bio Yorkshire, which uh, will create 4,000 new jobs for York and North Yorkshire, the new transport cluster and rail clusters, which are growing in strength, um, but also bringing in that opportunity for active travel England being intersected with that, the Institute of Auto uh, uh, Safety Autonomy and also um, Great British Railways um, could well come to York. And we want to ensure that that sector can grow and not be choked off in its current planned locations. But there are other economic clusters which are also strong and developing around digital creative film and high tech, which we certainly will want to see the connectivity to that central hub, transport hub at York Central, and then the um, routes connecting it. And as at the time of the planning, and I recall the discussions about new opportunities, anchor institutions landing in York, and of course we will welcome them to our city. The reality of what we're facing today is that we've got a massive opportunity to grow our economy more organically through SMEs, through uh, instituting incubators and accelerators where demand is high and where, where York has fallen down in the past. There's seen many of its graduates and skills and talents leaving the city as opposed to coming into the city and growing and finding its future here. And that, that's the opportunity I don't want to see choked off through this plan and therefore ensuring that we're planning through that through the types of sites that we're developing is going to be very important for our economic growth seeing organic growth startups and spin outs um, and ensuring we get that skills retention but most importantly of all ensuring there are jobs for all not just this dependency on retail and hospitality which has dogged our city and grown inequality for too long and therefore by ensuring that we've got those opportunities set out before us ensuring that we've got that economic planning in the right places in, and not seeing permitted development rights, taking away those economic opportunities is important, but also learning the lessons from places like Clifton Moor, which hasn't developed the economic opportunities envisaged, and yet more placement around suburban sites for economic opportunity does feature in the plan. And of course, it's car dependent as opposed to using more um, sustainable modes of transport as we move forward. So good jobs for our city will address that inequality, but the connectivity is absolutely vital for that. We've got a devolution deal coming down the line, which hopefully will grow that opportunity as well. So we need to ensure the sustainability and therefore the, the, the housing placed around in the appropriate spaces and then the infrastructure too. I want to uh, pick up on the issue of sustainability and certainly York Labour has been putting forward that, that vision of two sustainable conurbations, ensuring there's residential, economic and infrastructure sustainability and viability of those sites, ensuring that the transport services are able to sustain uh, a, a good economy and a good strong community, but we've got that good connectivity into York, not ending uh, over weekends or at six o'clock, but ensuring that goes into the late evening, really bringing vibrant communities into the city, ensuring that schools are sustainable. If we're looking at, for instance, uh, the suggestion around the conurbation size would support two, three, four entry schools or three, two, four entry schools. Um, and also a secondary school in each of those conurbations. Again, building those communities and identities, which are so important for, for social living. One of the, the, the facts what brought really forward in the plan was also about the scale of, of health services. And we know that a GP, um, Vale of York GP services, an average practice size is 13,914 patients. Now, again, that would show a great mapping onto the size of community that we're talking on, but also we'll be able to sustain community centres, places of worship, post offices and shops, local business units, important to have local commuting, um, energy um, and production as well, which is going to feature ever more as we look into the climate challenges and policing, which again wasn't particularly featured and yet is really important. I also wanted to touch on the issue of housing, which, of course, is a major issue for York. And I, I think we all recognise the challenges there. And 
we we'll put the challenge back to the inspectors about numbers. And while I appreciate that's being driven by um, government, we need to ensure that tenure is right too and ownership comes into that. So what we are increasingly seeing is housing supply being used for investment and that is having a significant impact on house prices and rental prices. The new figures out this week showing that the average rental price in York, £940 for calendar month, taking some 35% of somebody's income. Now the ninth most expensive city in England, it's the most expensive place in the north. Um, and um, those challenges are really hitting people in the community hard. The affordability ratio now moved to 8.21. Um, and what we are, are seeing is um, in places like Holgate, in the centre of York, house prices since July 2019 rising 29%, that having a significant impact clearly on people's ability to purchase property in our city. And what we're seeing is this tension which is growing now between the investor market in housing, moving into properties which are not lived in, um, buy to rent, um, second homes and Airbnbs, of which I understand we've got 1,785 and growing, this, this kind of extraction um, uh, kind of market, which actually is not addressing local need versus that growing demand. And of course, what it results in are families having to move away, children having to leave their schools. And of course, the local economy not being able to recruit to, to vital jobs to keep our city sustained our transport system uh, viable, but also to ensure that those opportunities aren't realised. And of course, when it comes to social housing, we've seen a depletion in stock with the, the right to buy, but also City of York Council just not building at the scale that it should. And our, our social demand threefold increase in my short tenure as an MP. So we know that we have got to address the affordability issue very much within the tenure of housing. And, and what residents constantly tell me is they don't want to live in flats they want to live in homes with gardens and I think we've learned over the last two years the importance of that external space um, and therefore this predominance particularly around social housing of focusing on uh, 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 flats is not an appropriate model for good quality of life and and the health um, associated clearly very closely correlated with, with, with housing. So we need to make sure that we um, address that. But at present, what we are witnessing, and this is feedback from the kind of the estate agents, is local people are being pushed out of the market, not only by the price, but also investors, particularly from London and the South East, hoovering up stock. Um, there's an example of someone paying £70,000 over the market value for, for a property, a family house, um, to turn it into an investment rather than a, a lived-in property. So I challenge the numbers to say that if we are going to see this continued trend, particularly in city centre locations, then we've got to address those numbers because it's not going to address local need. I look at um, Hungate, the Hudson Quarter and Terry's residence, where we know that um, there, there are many vacant properties um, in, in those developments. And I cannot see how these can then contribute towards those numbers because this is about developing a, a, a business um, or a, an investment rather than being a housing number. And I think that the local plan needs to reflect that, but also needs to ensure that housing is placed in the right place to dissuade people of that. And of course, we're also seeing through permitted development rights, economic space in our urban centre being turned again into these investment properties. So I urge the inspectors to look at that. If I can just turn to the issue of students as well, we know that 22.8% of development has gone to, to students. There is a challenge within the system because a brownfield site does not require section 106 um, uh, contributions. And as a result of that, student um, uh, development is outbidding general housing need and, and, and social developers. And as a result, we are seeing that, that growth in student numbers. Now, I know that the universities are ambitious and will be expanding. But alongside that, we need to make sure that uh, local housing need is not um, squeezed out of that markets and therefore we absolutely need to address that and I also want to to bring into to play um, in this discussion about traveller sites as well we need to have sufficiency of traveller sites to support 
um, the, the population there. And I often think uh, the, the traveling community, most um, discriminated community we know in our, our society also being pushed out of their city and their opportunity to have their lifestyle. So I think we need to ensure that we make those in, in investments in the right places. Um, and therefore, um, as I've said, um, I want to ensure that we've got homes for, for people to live in and um, understanding the value that that will bring to our city, but also our economy as we move forward and the infrastructure vitally as well. And we need to ensure that the class of allocation is committed to those sites. So designated space by user class, um, not only um, by value, is really important um, as we move forward. And I, just a, a final point on, on housing, just to encourage that we look at um, the catch up that is required because of the, the sluggish pace of development in York of housing and, and particularly would draw the uh, inspector's attention to the Sedgeville model to, to bring that on stream at a faster um, rate. If I may um, turn um, briefly to just talk about infrastructure, um, there is one piece that I wanted to bring to the inspector's attention which hasn't really come forward in the plan but um, is certainly now in, in, in play in discussion between York Hospital and the department and that's about a new hospital for York um, and that will be required in the next 15 years. A new location will be required which can um, will clearly create a windfall site on the Wigington Road where the current um, hospital is but we need to ensure that uh, any new location to address a new hospital, clearly a growing population are putting even more demands on that site. It's not only accessible to Scarborough rail station, um, the, the train station to get connectivity to Scarborough, but also accessible for patients, visitors and staff. And therefore, uh, to be sustainable, it must be able to um, not be isolated and car dependent. Just um, a couple more issues, if I, I may, to um, bring to the inspector's attention with regards to transport um i, I believe that the not having a, a transport strategy a local transport plan in play currently does undermine the soundness of the plan and i uh, am grateful to the work that york civic trust have done in trying to expedite that process um, but we need to make sure that there is proper correlation between strategic development sites and our, our transport infrastructure both with regards to scale and location. And of course, scale and location of sites, therefore, is really important in that discussion, which I do not believe that the plan reaches that goal. But also, we have to see not only um, a, a change of, of type of car and everyone's saying EVs, but they're not taking off at the pace expected, but also to ensure that we address issues around um, congestion, which the plan says will increase by 55%, number of trips by 20%, travel times by 30%, and at peak travel times 65%, meaning a city risks more congestion and pollution. We have got to see a modal shift and to so cycling, walking, and public transport. And of course, since the event of, of the plan, um, we've seen new modes of transport, I think, particularly about electric scooters and bikes, and we've, we've got to accommodate the next generation as we go, let alone because the climate emergency is encroaching ever more onto us. I believe that the plan itself has been developed and then a transport um, plan placed on top of it, which I do not believe is within the guidance of how tra transport should be developed. It looks to suck cars into the heart of York. Um, and of course, that will have its own challenges with regards to climate ambitions. And, and therefore we need to make sure that this is truly carbon sustainable as well as sustainable over the 15 years. And I will ch um, challenge the sustainability of the plan with regards to transport over that time. And, and believe that more work needs to be done on the litigation of those risks and um, would welcome more work in that area. We've also got Haxby um, Station um, being uh, in serious consideration now and how the power of that site can be used um, for the future. 
um, this is a, an incredible opportunity for our city. Um, and we need to look at that within our public transport modes. I understand that buses have been well debated and, and discussed, but we need to see a 30% increase in public transport use, cycling up 80% and walking by 25% in order to, to reach the, those transport and, and travel challenges. And we need to have better understanding about how those uh, sites at the edge of the city are going to be connected. I do want to just raise one other point is that when we are planning infrastructure, we do make need to make sure that it is accessible to active travel. And when you look at only eight out of um, 13 of our, our radio routes into the city and not yet having that infrastructure, that needs also to be planned into the future. Just finally, if I um, may just touch on the issue of the green belt. The green belt is so important to sustain in York, but my fear is that the durability test will fail of that green belt if these current plans go forward. And of course, I, I've talked about the changing um, context of our city. And therefore, um, I believe that we need to clearly lock in a, a, a green belt, which is going to be sustained over a period of time. I look at York um, Central, my constituency, and places like Acom. Uh, have the least green space in the city. The proposals to have Aiken Park there put forward by the local councillors who have done a lot of work on that shows how that getting those green lungs into the city will be really important for its future. And therefore seeing that undersupply of um, green spaces in the urban centre does present its own challenges around wellbeing and um, as I mentioned, green lungs for the city. So we need to think that through rather than densely packing the, the every site available for development in, in the centre of York. But at the same time, what we can't see is in a few years time, the spillover into already uh, identified green belt area. And therefore, to ensure that we've got sustainable development and then to lock in the green belt around it, I believe is what planning is designed for. What I believe has happened is that it's been decided where development is not wanted to call that green belt and then to make the case for where economic and um, housing development re resides. So I think we have got to see significant change in that approach to ensure that we build the sustainable future of York, which then won't be challenged before the end of this period of the local plan. I will conclude my remarks there and, and thank you for the time you've given. Thank you very much, Ms. Nusko. Um I, I understand you have to you have to rush off to, to ask a question in the house. So um, I'm quite happy for you to, to, to leave the meeting whenever you whenever you need to. Certainly won't take any <laughs> any offence or anything like that. Um, Mr Mr. Henderson, that there was a lot in that, quite wide ranging. Um, so there was, matter. yes. How do you, you want to respond? Well, perhaps in this way. So you've heard a number of different topics being raised across issues that you've already covered in quite some detail already. And yes. there's a general principle, both in respect of Miss Mastrell, I don't mean Miss Mastrell any disrespect, but generally today, we don't intend to repeat things that we've already said to you in the examination process. So I, I will quite simply refer you back to the relevant parts and, and, uh, and, and leave it at at that on the whole. If of course if there's anything specific that's new that we need to address, we will. And if there's anything specific that you have concerns about, we will of course address that. Well, um, one, so, uh, forgive me, Miss Henderson. One, one thing that I'd be interested in hearing about um, is in relation to the new hospital. Um, that's that's certainly not something that's um, come up in discussion um, previously. Yeah, um, so it'd be helpful to us, I think, if the council could um, tell us Tell us about that and, and, and where things are. Uh, absolutely, sir. So CYC 79 is the document, PDF page 16 within that. I don't I don't ask you to turn it up, but that's the reference, so you have it for later. And um, what, what that will tell you in, in very short summary is that the hospital is planned for delivery in excess of 15 years from the start of, well, from today, um, outside of the planned period. The council, notwithstanding the fact that this will be delivered quite some time outside of the plan period, are engaging with the hospital to understand what their requirements are, what their ambitions are. But in essence, it's not a matter 
that needs to trouble you uh, in the preparation of this plan because of its delivery is so far into the future outside of the plan period with which we are concerned. Okay, so is that to say then that in, in your view, um, that's too far off to be considering reserving land or anything like that? Correct, sir. And because the, the plans are at such an inchoate stage, it, it, it wouldn't be feasible to do that for that reason as well, both the timing and the nature of the um, proposal as it stands today. Thank, thank you, Mr. Henderson. Um, take on board what you say about matters already being covered. Um, I think it's a, it's useful to know about the hospital too, obviously. Um, what I'm going to do is move the discussion on. Um, the rest of this virtual session today, I'm going to deal with matter by matter. So first of all, I want to deal with um, matter one. which concerns the strategic vision outcomes and development principles. We, we had a hearing obviously that covered these matters, um, but there are some who weren't able to make their contributions to that. I've got Mr May, uh, Councillor Douglas and, and Mr Hancock who wanted to make submissions on matter one. Um, Ms Douglas, you've got your picture up. Um, would you like to go first? Yes, thank you, uh, Sarah, you absolutely. Um, so I'm here today to represent uh, the, the uh, York Labour Party. And um, I just want to make a statement that um, we believe that the plan put forward by the council is flawed for the reasons that York Labour Party set out in the written submissions. But having said that, York Labour does not wish to see this plan fail. And to the contrary, the plan must be rectified and adopted as quickly as possible. And we at York Labour therefore see our role as assisting the inquiry to reach the point where a plan, but a far better sound plan, can be adopted. Um, and on the, the vision side, for a start, um, we don't feel as though the, the vision actually is strong enough. We believe it's far too weak and that the statement fails to match the expectations of the MPPF to act actively manage the implications of that. So we're suggesting that this section of the vision should read, the plan will ensure that the vision and outcomes are delivered in a sustainable way that addresses the challenges of climate change, protects residents and the biosphere from environmental impacts and secures social economic and cultural well-being for all York residents and then these amendments should then be reflected in the changes to the spatial strategy and development plan policies regarding the economy, housing and transport. Um, we also believe that the plan is not <clears throat> sustainable environmentally, it's especially inadequate in the face of the scale of the climate and biodiversity um, emergencies that require, as uh, Ms Maskell said, rapid and significant action. Around transport, there's no credible comprehensive strategy to address the existing access problems that York has. I leave aside the ones that will, um, the implementation of the plan will uh, uh, face us with. And the plan's failure to assess and address alternative options and the predicted increase in traffic and congestion is a real concern. Um, we also believe that the plan is not sustainable economically or socially, and we've said in previous submissions that it fails to deliver overriding objective of prosperity for all. It fails to address the out of control explosion of housing costs that Ms Maskell outlined to you for both purchase and renting and to provide anything like the level of affordable housing, particularly for rental that the city currently needs. And this is particularly important for our lower and middle income groups. And I think that you are well aware 
that York does have a large section of our population that falls into this category due to the prevalence of the hospitality, retail and tourism industry in York. And at this point in time, we have rental um, levels that are um, approaching and around the same as in the southeast, but people in York do not earn that level of wage to support those rental values. So we're also um, looking at how the plan seeks to address new housing, the vision and outcomes to provide good quality homes and opportunities and the, to achieve a target of 867 dwellings a year. This includes substantial areas of land for garden village development um, and they are listed in the, the plan. But our argument is that the original submission, we want to see sustainable larger developments and we think that two would be appropriate. We want to see developments that mean that those communities really can build and live their lives in those developments and not have to travel outside of those um, to go to school, to work, etc. At the current level, they just are not big enough to mean that the infrastructure and the local services across the full range can be supported and that local transport also a regular transport system to support sustainability can be supported. So I think you've already heard from the York Civic Trust analysis that they think that those um, those dwellings, uh, sorry, those settlements should be 15,000 houses um, uh, um, dwellings in size to support those services and we are in support of that. Um, also, um, I think we would like to raise that um, uh, we need an econ economic approach to this. Um, we have great opportunities coming up in York, around York Central. Um, I would like to question whether it is appropriate to say that we shouldn't consider the uh, new development of the hospital at this point in time. Our city is um, in such dire constraints over land that if we don't um, consider that at this point, I really don't see how that can be um, accommodated in a location that works environmentally and sustainably and accessibly for all of our, our residents. And um, so the economic side of things, we really need to make sure that we are using the, um, the, the class use classes to make sure that we do allow for a cross range of economic development um, sites. Um, at this point in time, we have lost significant um, middle income jobs. Um, it's hard to see how there's a progression for people to move from lower paid into uh, better paid work without using those use classes and making sure that we build a sustainable city that offers um, economic um, uh, uh, equality for all of our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Douglas. Um, Mr Henderson, I'm not going to come, I'll come back to you now. I'll, I think I'll hear from uh, the other the other two people who wanted to, to make a submission on this this matter first. Are you happy with that? Good. Um, Mr May from York Civic Trust had a submission he wanted to make on this matter. <clears throat> yes, thank you, sir. Um, and my particular thanks to you for allowing me to return on matter one. And I apologise that um, uh, COVID finally got me um, and laid me low during uh, the matter one um, in person hearing. Um, I've obviously had an opportunity to comment on matters four, uh, six and eight since then. So um, uh, the background I wanted to give to now, now is really a background to some of those comments. Um, first of all, just to reiterate, York Civic Trust is wholly committed to helping secure um, a local plan as soon as possible based broadly on the current draft, but we do want to make sure that its weaknesses are resolved uh, to make it sound and internally consistent. Um, in terms of matter one, I had four points I wanted to flag. Um, the first 
comes back to a comment that Mr. Alvin made on the matter six, where he purported to suggest that the York Civic Trust was wanting um, wholly freestanding developments on the fringe of York. This was not in any way what we were proposing. Um, what we have been looking at is what is needed to make a community sustainable and to support um, uh, the facilities which that community needs, particularly, as I was saying yesterday under Matter 8, to reduce the need to travel and reduce the distances which people travel. And it's actually quite difficult. Councillor Douglas kindly referred to our um, notional figure of 15,000. It's quite difficult to find good literature which supports a particular figure. But if we look at um, some of the indicators of what is needed for different types of community support, um, we estimate that for a commercial bus service, which operates at least uh, four times an hour and into the evenings and on the weekends, one needs a population of approaching 12,000. Um, and that's um, a figure that um, comes quite clearly from an analysis of communities in York, um, including um, Haxby and Strensel. Forgive me, Mr. Mayor, I, I didn't know I didn't, I didn't, the figure. Uh, 12,000. Thank you. And I think we heard from uh, uh, Rachel Maskell that the figure for a GP surgery in the Vale of York area was about 13,000. Um, uh, a three form secondary school would need about 12,500. And it was those sorts of figures that led us to thinking that a target of 15,000 um, would be sensible. Now, it may be a, a smaller figure than that, but I do think that the council needs to demonstrate that in providing these communities, and the largest at Elvington is about 8,000, that the facilities that that community needs, including a surgery, including a secondary school, including um, high quality public transport, can be provided and sustained. That was the first point. Uh, the second was a, a specific point on wording. Um, we felt that um, in DP3, um, policies um, 10, Roman 10 and Roman 11 um, don't adequately match what is looked for in NPPF 2012. Um, that requires plans actively to manage patterns of growth to make the fullest possible use of public transport, walking and cycling, and focus significant development in locations which are or can be made sustainable. What we have in policies 10 and 11 is words like promote, promoting and where possible. And what we would like to see is those two strengthened um, so that rather than promote, it's ensure, rather than promote and facilitate, it's achieve, and that the words where possible are uh, removed because um, uh, mitigating the impact of residual car trips on the highway network has to be done. It shouldn't be a question of only doing it where it seems possible to do it. So that was the second point. Um, the third really comes back to a, a discussion that I had with um, uh, uh, Mr. Barclay yesterday um, on this interesting question of reducing the need to travel. Um, and I made the point then that if you can help people work from home and shop from home, if you can help people make shorter journeys, then you have a significant benefit for climate, but also for congestion and the local environment. And um, policy DP3 includes a, a helpful set of development principles, which we support. But we do feel the list is incomplete in that particular aspect. And reviewing the work by the Royal Town Planning Institute, by the Town and Country Planning Association, um, 
by the local government association and by transport for new homes. We would like to see the, the following additional principles included. Development needs to be of mixed use and high density. Development should be designed around high quality walking and cycling routes. Those routes need to provide short, safe and convenient links to a core set of community facilities. And development needs to be managed, uh, designed to manage servicing traffic and to uh, um, accommodate appropriate emerging technologies. And if we could see those four bullet points added in, that then provides the internal consistency which we need when we come on in phase four to looking at the, the transport matters. And then my final point, so as, um, it relates to questions. Forgive me, Mr. May. I, yes. I think that in your, in your last bullet point, you, you, you mentioned, I think you said developing technologies. Um, what, what, what I said emerging technologies. Emerging, yes. Okay, emerging technologies. What, what kind of thing do you have in mind there? Well, of course, there's the whole question of electric vehicles and okay. support for those. Um, the government is very enthusiastic about autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles. Uh, we have serious doubts about the role of self-driving um, uh, self vehicles uh, in urban areas like York. Um, but if that technology is to develop, uh, as indeed it will, then we have to think about how best they are provided for in the city itself um, and in um, the new communities. Uh, for example, there's some very useful research which points to um, the clear preference, if such vehicles are in use, for them to be in shared ownership, uh, much like a car club operates now, so that they're not free for the individual to use and miraculously have his car or her car go back home on its under its own steam, um, adding um, further uh, travel to the road system. So it's things like this, looking ahead, um, Within the next 15 years, these technologies will be commonplace and they need to be reflected. Is that sufficient? May I move on? Yeah, I, I understand. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then the final point is on question one four on the sustainability appraisal. And, and we apologize that we didn't do this document justice um, back in 2018 when we were submitting our comments, but we have looked at it in detail since and we are really quite worried that um, aspects of it are unsound. Um, the appraisal has some very useful and very apposite guide questions, uh, questions that the appraiser should answer but unfortunately the indicators that the appraiser then uses don't ask, answer the questions. Two examples, first of all a simple one air quality, the only indicator is proximity to an air quality management area. That says absolutely nothing about the pollution generated by travel to and from new sites, which might, in the worst instance, lead to the need for new air quality management areas. Um, slightly more complicated on the transport side, um, the indicators all relate to proximity to a transport service, whether it's a cycle route or a bus route or an adopted highway. One would assume they'd all have adopted highways. Um, but if you think about that, um, a new development site would have the same score whether it had five houses or 5,000 houses because all you're asking is, is, is it close to those facilities? In practice, it's the fact that we're putting more houses on the periphery of York and potentially not mitigating the impact of uh, growth in car use that leads to congestion. But the sustainability appraisal raises the guide question about congestion but does absolutely nothing to answer the question, does this strategic site 
contribute to congestion. So I, we do feel that by the time, ideally, by the time we move on to phase three, um, that has been corrected so that the appraisal does actually answer the guide questions that it sets. So those are my four points. So I'm very happy to hear what Mr. Henderson says and to take any other questions. Thank you, Mr. May. What I'm what I'm going to do next before coming to Mr. Henderson is Mr. Hancock, you're you're with us representing the banks group. Good morning, sir. Yes, indeed. I'm uh, Justin want, Hancock. Uh, you want to, sorry, you wanted to speak about matter one. Yes, I've got a, a, a brief um, things to say on matter one. Uh, I'm principal development planner with the Banks Group. Uh, I'm standing in for Joe Perkins, who submitted the uh, responses, but he's otherwise detained today. Um, very simply, we feel that the, the vision uh, for the plan, uh, it is disappointing that it doesn't include uh, a, a, an aspiration to create places to live uh, beyond just um, meeting uh, residential uh, development needs. This should be uh, a core uh, vision for the city uh, to create um, you know, sufficient but also high quality housing. And, and allied to that, uh, we think in DP2, little Roman one, um, we think there is also a role that new housing has in the economy uh, of York and something which gets overlooked uh, time and time again in local plans is the role of uh, creating uh, housing industry uh, in supporting the whole local economy of York City. So that's two things we would like to see. Um, really, the, uh, the only other matter on uh, matter one was in DP3, we felt uh, that the, there needs to be more in DP3 regarding uh, allocating uh, development in uh, areas which benefit from existing uh, public transport and service pro provision, whether it's education, uh, GPs uh, and obviously bus services. Bus services. Uh, we, feel that, we feel that that uh, would be a, a useful introduction to DP3. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Uh, Mr. Henderson, we've come to the end of matter one. I wonder, was there anything you wanted to add at this point? So um, I will pick up a uh, pick up a few points. Um, much of this has been covered. Indeed, some of it was covered yesterday, quite quite recently. Which I'm, uh, so we won't repeat um, any of that. I think that the the headline point, and not uh, it is repetition, is to repeat essentially Mr. Alvin's submission to you at the very start of this phase that these these points of essentially minor drafting on these policies are not ones which go to soundness. This, this is tinkering around the edges. None of the points you've heard today about uh, what could or couldn't be added or omitted from these policies goes to whether or not the plan is sound. We'll address them anyway, but that's the important context of what you've heard. Um, Miss Douglas and her proposed vision uh, well, that was essentially, and I followed it very carefully as you read it out, that was essentially what is there in the second paragraph of the vision anyway, with the addition of the word biosphere. Um, so we don't see that as, as one that, that requires uh, change. The next uh, point raised by Miss Douglas was in respect of uh, ambition. I use that word broadly, but you've already heard our evidence about the uplift in jobs, the 650 uh, jobs per annum figure, that is an ambitious figure. And then as a consequence of that, the unconstrained approach to housing. We're not reducing housing need because of any constraints. That in and of itself is also ambitious. So uh, it, on our submission, ambition is embedded into both of those key uh, planks in the plan. That then leads us on to the point that uh, both Miss Douglas and uh, Mr May made. This is around the question of is, uh, what I'm going to call self-contained communities, the size of communities and how that's approached. Um, we've already touched on this already, but uh, we will say something additional now, given it's been raised by um, by both of those participants. Um, Miss uh, Thelma Mode has, is going to deal with that point, sir, so I'm just going to hand over to her on that. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, so as discussed uh, recently in, in the hearings, the plan sets out a framework for the delivery of infrastructure to support the development that's envisaged in the local plan cumulatively and in the case of strategic site allocations, as we see in section three of the plan specific to those strategic sites. And, and we highlight in our most recent infrastructure note, ECCYC81, some of the specific provisions uh, made there to enable the successful delivery of the plan, going to where, what and, and, and how um, that, that infrastructure will be provided. I'd also highlight policy DM1, on infrastructure and developer contributions, which identifies that developers will be required to provide um, the infrastructure to service their development and mitigate any direct local impacts. Uh, the panel is very clearly informed by evidence on infrastructure. Um, the inf earlier infrastructure delivery work in documents SD127 uh, and then CD018 submitted with the local plan and then again, the more recent updates since, um, since submission of the local plan um, set out our infrastructure process, but also this ongoing process of infrastructure planning with infrastructure providers across the city, including the hospital who we are in regular engagement now as they evolve their estate strategy, even though, as Mr Henderson has indicated, that is, they're, they're looking at matters beyond, beyond this plan period. Um, we dealt with the issue of self self-contained uh, settlements too earlier in the week, and I know that the um, research by the Town and Country Planning Association um, document ECCYC81 is now part of the library, um, and that document clearly indicates the the fact that it is undesirable and and and, and quite difficult um, to create genuinely self-contained. Uh, self-contained settlements in the context of an existing uh, structure, existing infrastructure network, and that's across the country. So um, what our focus is, and our focus is set out in policy DP3, is around creating sustainable communities. Um, and I think it's neatly summarised um, in points 6 to 11a, um, uh, 6 to 11 of policy DP3, which sets out um, the, in the intent there. Um, if I might deal with some of the sustainability yeah. appraisal um, matters, I think it's um, important to be clear that at each stage of plan preparation, the SA has identified, described and evaluated the effects of the overall spatial distribution and the allocation and reasonable alternatives in a manner consistent with the SA process. This process is complied with the relevant regulations and um, any changes have been clearly identified in subsequent addenda um, to the SA. Um, the SA has also taken account of uh, changes emerging in the evidence base in line with the iterative approach to the SA. Um, and, and this includes the uh, any changes in relation to air quality uh, monitoring evidence. Um, again, in, in, in the SA, clearly detailed there. Um, on the points related to um, sort of the detailed changes to DP uh, DP three, three suggested, um, I would just highlight, uh, I'd just echo rather uh, the point made by Mr. Henderson. I don't think these are matters which go to the soundness of the plan, but they are in any case addressed in policies in other parts of the the plan. I, I'll point to policy TP one, sorry T one, forgive me, sustainable access in 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 particular. And policy H2, which talks about um, relating density to um, higher, uh, so higher accessibility transport locations, uh, ju just as two examples. Um, as we talked about in the hearings, these are development plan principles which underpin um, the, and set out the intent of the other policies which follow in later chapters of the plan. And some of these changes would introduce quite a high degree of repetition because those matters are clearly covered in later policies. And so that this is a this is a classic example of needing to read the plan as a whole. DP one, two, and three high level principles applied through the detailed development management policies that we get in the remainder of the plan. Uh, Ms. Dilma Mode has given you some examples there, but it applies equally to uh, Mr. Hancock's comment around uh, creating places to live. 
in essence, the approach of all of the three participants you've heard from this morning is to try to take those broad principles to create a set of prescriptive criteria in a way that's just inappropriate. The plan is read as a whole. We have the broad direction set by the principles. We turn and we look at the development management principles on each uh, policy, sorry, on each development, and that's how it manifests itself um, as applications come forward and as developments come forward. Creating places to live is the whole is the whole plan. It is the plan as in all of its parts as they apply to each application. It's not in and of itself a particular uh, criteria or something that needs to be uh, added in. But in any event, none of those matters go to um, sustainability. Uh, sorry, to soundness. Uh, just touching very briefly though on uh, the sustainability appraisal and Mr May's points. These aren't foreshadowed in his um, in his uh, in his uh, re representations to you in, in writing. Um, fortuitously, the issue of air quality is one that you'll, uh, I'm afraid, get quite some detail on from Mr. Elvin in his response to Mr. Crucier. So I don't think I'm going to need to say anything more about that now. You, you will get that uh, in very short order, um, uh, and that will take care of that. But I, I would make one general point about the two comments that you were made that were made to you. Neither of those comments are ones which are showstoppers. This is a classic example of different participants disagreeing about how you might reach a judgment on a particular factor. It's not said that the sustainability appraisal is inadequate or unlawful. This is a classic example of different judgments. Insofar as those judgments need to be considered, we'll get to that in the next phase on a site by site basis. But I did not hear, and I don't understand the point to be made, that the sustainability appraisal is not adequate uh, on the basis of the two matters that Mr May uh, raised this morning. I, on that basis, I don't think we need to say anything more about it. Thank you, Mr Henderson and your, and your colleagues. Um, I'm going to move the discussion on to matter two. And that's housing need and requirement. Mr. Hancock, you had a, a submission to make on, on this. Thank you, sir. Yes, so, I sorry. Sorry, hang on a minute, Mr. Hancock. Mr. May, can I help? Did you want to well, speak? I, the, um, your programme officer had encouraged us to raise a hand if we had comments. I just wanted very briefly to respond to Mr. Henderson's and, and his colleagues' comments. Um, really with two points. First of all, I do wish the council wouldn't insist on claiming that the Civic Trust is looking for self-contained communities. We are not. I, I yeah, hope I made that clear. Forgive me, Mr May. Yeah, I, I, I noticed that. I, I, I can reassure you that we heard what, what, what you said. Thank you. I, I know that that is not, not what, you, what you said to us. Thank you. Well, that's helpful. I'm grateful to you for that. And the second point is I'm we are very happy to return to the issues that we've raised in phase three and in phase four. Um, but we are looking forward to the more detailed analysis of mitigation and of action to reduce the need for travel which the council uh, has promised you will be available in time for those hearings. So I'm very happy to defer those points until phases three and four. And, and with that, many thanks for allowing me to speak and I will leave you at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr May. Thank you very much, Mr May. We will be coming back to those points in, in three and four, no doubt. Mr Hancock. I think there might be another hand up there. Is there another hand? I'll, I'll, I'll continue. Yes, I'll, I'll keep my, my comments uh, short and sweet because I appreciate that some of these matters have been discussed already. Um, but on the, the housing uh, need uh, and the market signals in particular, uh, we drew attention to the fact that the 2017 Schma concluded that there was a need for an uplift in the housing needs figure to reflect market signals and the acute need for affordable houses in particular, and it recommended an uplift of 10%. 
Uh, I believe that this should be uh, acted upon this recommendation, particularly given some of the dynamic market signals that you've even heard about today from the MP, where more and more houses are going to Airbnb and the rents are, are increasing. I, 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 Mr. Hancock, forgive me. Sorry, I, I had some back, background noise in the, in the room that we're, we're using this morning, so I didn't quite catch what you said there. I, I think that you were talking about the 2017 Schmar recommending a 10% uplift. Yes. Um, I wasn't quite sure what the Schmar said that that was for. I didn't quite catch that part. Well, it's affordable houses um, in particular uh, because of the acute need within the overall total for affordable housing. Which I believe is the matter you've you've already heard evidence on. Is it is it for affordable housing or is it for affordability? Well, the quote is in response to both market signals and affordable housing need. We have advocated a ten percent uplift in the uh, objectively assessed need, um, and bringing it to nine hundred and fifty three dwellings per annum. So I guess that's that's a mixture of the two, but. Uh, you know, my my view on this is 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 that affordable housing is a a, a need within the total uh, and one which gets sometimes gets overlooked. Uh, if you have uh, a global total uh, and uh, policies to ch try to achieve a percentage, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll hit that ab absolute need for affordable housing quantitative need. Uh, and I think it's something that the planning system uh, struggles with. Uh, and I think that a 10% uplift, whilst a crude uh, uh, application to, to, to apply to it, would go some way to, to achieving that. Um, can I um, just check, Mr Henderson, I, I've just had an email from um, Mrs Crooks, the programme officer, to say that there's a problem with Wi-Fi. Is that, is that, a, is that in your that room? Don't worry, sir. We've we've surmounted that hurdle. We'll have to keep going. Okay, thank you. Um, apologies, Mr. Hancock. Please, please carry on. Well, that, really, that's all I want to say on the objectively assessed need. So we've covered it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Uh, Mr. Mr. Merritt, you've got your hand up. How can I help? muted at the same time. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, Claire Douglas has unfortunately had to leave uh, for the annual council meeting, so I'm substituting for her, uh, as discussed with Carol Crooks uh, uh, beforehand. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come back uh, in terms of the responses from Mr Henderson uh, to the matter uh, one issues. Um, some of the, uh, uh, in, in two particular, uh, regards. He was, he was making the point that suggested amendments to um, the vision statement uh, and to uh, some of the uh, DP policies, uh, which were, were not sufficient to make the plan unsound, were to, to some degree matters of, uh, of judgment. I think our point would be that they do help to make the plan unsound because the failure to adequately address some of those issues, particularly around the transport, has led to an unsustainable uh, future traffic pattern which contravenes uh, the, uh, the, the objectives of Para 1.32. So we would say the, cu the cumulative effect of having too weak too inadequate a vision and supporting DP policies, uh, it does make the plan unsound. The second second point I made, uh, what want to make is he suggested in you know that these were also covered later on in policies TP one and so on. I'd I'd make the point that policy TP one um, is primarily focused uh, on the development control approach uh, to be applied within. Uh, the approved plan is not really guiding uh, the allocation of sites, the scale of sites and so on, which we are concerned about and feel should be uh, dealt with in those overarching uh, policies, earlier policies. Um, uh, 
so uh, as I say, I, I, I don't, don't think the council's response is an adequate one uh, to, to that that has been addressed. And I'd make the final point that um, it, the inspector uh, dismissed some of uh, Mr May's arguments on the basis that they weren't in the original uh, civic trust um, uh, submission, but they are in other submissions, including the York Labour Party and the other organisations that I have uh, represented uh, uh, earlier. OK, Mr. Mayor, I think you mean Mr. Henderson rather than the inspector. I don't think... We Sorry, I, apologies, apologies. I'm, <laughs> I'm tired after all this. I thought I didn't recall doing that. <laughs> Good. Mr. Henderson, did you want to respond to, to Mr. Mayor? I'd, I'd really like to... I certainly don't so, want to be rerunning the hearing that we've already had, but I yeah, need so to give I thought, you I thought we'd moved on. So we've, we've done a reshuffle uh, as a result, but nevertheless, uh, Ms. Tumorode is still here and she will just wrap up on those couple of points for you very briefly okay. on that one. Okay, well, well, just to keep it extremely brief, I'd just point to um, the, the infrastructure note recently submitted, um, that's EX, CYC 79 and paragraph 25, which explains both the overall strategic um, approach taken in the plan as it relates to transport alongside, which goes alongside the um, development management, the individual um, approach, which um, is set out in TP1 and other policies, which are then applied in, through the development management process to individual developments um, within the city. But, but both, both of those aspects are addressed in, in the plan. And in so far as there's any concern about DP3, Revenue will tend directly uh, cross, cross refers to, to the, the principles of the MPPF on this, and they are captured in that uh, in that sub paragraph. So I think that's that's pretty much everything we're going to say on on matter one, unless there's anything outstanding from your perspective. Not from myself. I think we're we're fine on matter one. There were some points made on matter two by Mr. Hancock. Yes, sir. Um, oh, let's let's deal with that now. Um, the, the, the short headline answer is that we are adopting an approach which is based on, as you as you know now, an economic-led uh, OAN rather than a demographic-led OAN. Uh, but I appreciate um, there's concern about that uplift and whether or not the uplift should be factored in. And Miss Bartle will very briefly summarise. What, what you already know, but which might help Mr Hancock on, on the question of uplifts. Yes, thank you. Um, I think um, starting point really is to say that um, the, the uplifts are um, embedded within the approach that we've taken, as Ms Henderson has just um, alluded to. Um, what we have done here, what um, since that SHMA of 2017, um, is to further the work around um, the housing needs assessment um, and the requirement that the plan was working to. There was intricate debate um, on this particular day around the evidence and which parts of the um, adjustments were factored into the, um, the overall calculation. And in summary, um, what our position is, is that the translation of the 2016 um, and 2018 um, demographic starting points um, into the, um, the figure that's related to the jobs growth of 650 jobs per annum um, inherently makes adjustments for those um, additional needs which would be captured through um, a kind of market signals adjustment and affordable, affordable housing adjustment. Um, but what we're saying here is that um, those adjustments, if we were to take it from the demographic starting point, would go nowhere near the figure that we arrive at from the um, economic um, jobs growth translation. Um, so just for comparison um, reasons, the 2016 base starting point of 484 dwellings um, which is captured in our housing needs assessment of 2019 um, would relate, um, would equate, sorry, to a 64% uplift to where we get to um, with the uh, 790 dwellings per annum, which is what we're talking about as our OAHN. Um, based on the 2018 um, projections, 
that actually increases to 160% increase above the baseline demographic. So um, in neither of those cases, um, the, the uplift that we would apply, the 10% that was given as the, um, the example from the 2017 SMAR, um, is, is far below those in, in both instances. So um, very simply, we, we say that the, um, the figure that we've arrived at um, goes over and above any uplifts that would ordinarily be applied because we're taking a, an economic led approach in this case. And that's even if you were to add on that 10% on the demographic based approach, it's still not going to get to the level um, that we've assessed based on the on the economic approach. Thank you, that's what I'd understood from from the hearing. We discussed this matter at the hearing the other day, um, two weeks ago now. Um, I'm going to move on to matter three. And that is, if you'll bear with me, economic development. Mr. Hancock, you want, oh, sorry, no, not Mr. Hancock. Um, Mr. Merritt, you wanted to make a submission on this. Yes, uh, th thank you. Um, um, I think our main point at this stage, beyond the uh, written submissions, is that if you actually look at the on the ground numbers of jobs that are being created, York continues to actually create more jobs than are uh, forecast. Um, York has uh, it has been bucking uh, the trends and continues to do so, and the space allocations absolutely must uh, support this, uh, including the uh, range uh, of facilities that uh, Claire picked up in her uh, matter one uh, comment, so I won't uh, say any more on that aspect. Um, we also uh, do not believe that the plan has adequately catered uh, for the benefits of the uh, universities uh, in this city, particularly the University of York, uh, and the uh, amount of jobs that it is helping to uh, deliver. Um, and, you know, it, that is another argument for uh, supporting the higher allocations that uh, we have advocated. Um, Rachel, I think, has picked up a number of the other areas. Uh, I think she also mentioned the, uh, the Bio Yorkshire initiative, uh, which is likely to uh, create a very substantial number of jobs, um, which again reinforces uh, our, our, our point. So um, I, I think those were the main key additional points I wanted to make uh, on behalf of York Labour Party. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Merritt. Mr. Henderson. Thank you, sir. Um, back to Ms. Dilma Mose on this one. Um, we'll take it in the stages. So the first point is around uh, the growth of numbers on the ground. Uh, Ms. Dilma Mose on that point, please. Thank you. Um, well, the substantive points about the appropriateness of the job target we've adopted is set out in our hearing statement. That job target has been derived from Oxford Economics Modelling, a commonly used source in the context of um, employment land studies and projections of this type for local plans. Um, we've not taken just the baseline figures that come from that model, rather we've uplifted those based on our economic development strategy. Um, so what we think we've got to is, um, in line with the MPPF, an aspirational but realistic as an evidence backed um, target, taking into account some of the challenges we heard about in um, certainly in, in considerable detail in earlier sessions from a number of um, particip participants who were suggesting that number was too high in the context of Brexit, COVID, et cetera, and some of the uncertainties there, but also taking into account um, the wider op opportunities in, um, in the context of York and its relative resilience um, in, in, in the immediate aftermath of, of, of COVID, but also thinking about Bio Yorkshire, which I sort of emphasise as a, a, a regional um, initiative. Um, just want to deal with um, sort of the, the, the growth projections and what's happening on the ground. Um, our Oxford Economics Report, EX CYC 29, um, looks at um, growth 
growth projections and what you see is earlier is higher growth in the earlier parts of the plan period and as described in our hearing statements uh, you see that growth um, sort of stabilizing over time so that 650 figure is is an average and we see uh, higher growth in the earlier part of the plan period and some stabilization thereafter that's the first point the second point is the issue of space allocation of space uh, we're still ready just on that please so the 650 jobs target was used to inform the um, supply response, if you like, the allocations that we've identified in policy EC1 um, of the plan. But it was not the only factor used in identifying that supply response. Um, we, we also thought very carefully about the need to provide for sub um, flexibility in that supply to allow for churn and change in the existing market, in particular for um, industrial uses. And that was in response to engagement with um, business and other stakeholders um, in, in the city. And that's clearly acknowledged in our 2017 evidence, the um, Employment Land Review SD 064. And then that only leaves the university. Um, so you've heard from the university direct uh, from the horse's mouth. Uh, we are, as we've already indicated, working with the university to bring forward states of common ground, and we're going to come back to you on that in due course. I don't think anything that you've heard today has materially advanced the debate there, and it's proper that we continue with the approach that we've already outlined to you on, on that front. I'm content with that. Thank you. We're going to move on to matter four, the spatial strategy and site selection. Mr Hancock, I'll come to you first. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll try to pull together uh, the, the various comments we've made on, on the subheadings. Um, basically, what we've observed is uh, that there isn't a clear hierarchy of, of uh, uh, locations for development that you might expect to see in a local plan, uh, which we think would be obviously the city centre first, but then the edge of the York City uh, fulfilling the next most sustainable location and then settlements beyond uh, the city. And I think this has given rise through uh, the allocations process to quite a dispersed uh, pattern of allocations and a lot of opportunities which are really quite close in to uh, York City have been passed over for more peripheral um, sites to be allocated. Um, and and the other thing that we would link into this really is the uh, the way in which the spatial principles have been uh, applied uh, in in the balance because of course there are five principles and in some some sites will score well on one and not so well on another but we believe that the sustainability criteria of of, of, of targeting housing on passport on transport routes and arterial routes has been um, uh, disadvantaged and greater weight has been placed on the heritage and landscape uh, principles uh, that uh, um, the green wedge and uh, approaches into the city have been protected uh, at, at a very high level of protection and yet within these areas, obviously some are very sensitive, but within these areas you have very uh, logical development sites which would have a low impact on the openness of the green belt, for example, and would be well related to existing services, uh, facilities and very strong bus links and cycle links as well. Um, they've been overlooked. So I think that that is our, our response. It's about the the lack of a logical hierarchy uh, and succession of, of looking for sites. Thank you, Mr Hancock. We did talk about um, those matters at the hearing uh, the other day, but um, Mr Henderson, you can come back on that in due course. Mr Vernon, you had a, a point to make on matter four as well. Mr. Vernon. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. I'm here. Uh, let me just try and make that a bit bigger. Okay, can you can you hear me? Can you see me? We can hear and see you. I'll just turn my volume up a little bit. Okay. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, my, my, my point on matter four is a very uh, specific legal point. Um, I, I sent a, an email um, uh, to the programme officer, uh, I think a couple of days ago, just, just to, 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 to put that in writing, in addition to the representations that have been made previously. Um, I, I, it's not, it, it's a fairly succinct uh, point. Uh, is it best if I just talk you through that? Go on. Uh, and it also, I don't know, it also re relates to, um, it, it's, it's an area of land that is that is included as white land in a neighbourhood plan. So I don't know whether it's useful to, uh, to, to tell you where that is. Uh, if that helps, but, but otherwise, I think it's probably better if I just talk talk you through my point. I think if you've made the point already in writing, and we have it, um, then yeah, please go through it. Okay, so um, uh, the, the the particular area of land is 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 is, is one that's in the um, Poppleton neighbourhood plan. Uh, which the Poppleton Neighbourhood Plan was adopted in in 2017, and, I, and I've, I've I've made reps and and, and also sent an extract of the proposals map um, from from that 2017 document at page 16, um, and uh, the, the particular paragraphs of the uh, the Neighbourhood Plan I think are, are paragraphs 4.1.6 and 4.1.10. Uh, which will also be repeated in my submission. Whilst the uh, the, the neighbourhood plan uh, accepts the local plan as a proper vehicle to establish greenbelt boundaries, the neighbourhood plan at Poppleton did establish and adopt a detailed inner boundary for development control purposes. And to our knowledge, this is this is the only neighbourhood plan that has gone in, in York that has gone this far. Uh, subsequent neighbourhood plans like the one in Huntington, expressly stood back from actually setting a greenbelt boundary in their plan. This Poppleton neighbourhood greenbelt boundary has been acknowledged by subsequent decision makers and as recently as the Carbon Homes Decision Appeal, uh, which I can give you the reference details for, where the inspector refused a residential development to the south of Borough Bridge Road as a result of its greenbelt conflict, conflict with the with the, with, the, with the allocation in, in that neighbourhood plan. In that did decision... You, did you say, Mr Vernon, that you have the reference for that appeal? Yes, I have. Do you want me to read that to you now? Yeah, please go on. We just need the seven digits. A bit at the end, which yeah. is three three two seven one zero four five. Thank you, that, that enables us to look it up on our internal system, so that's useful. Yeah. Carry on. Okay, good. Uh, so in that decision, the inspector gave full weight, weight to the green belt status in that neighbourhood neighbouring neighbourhood plan. So having regard to the above, the land immediately to the north of the North Minster Business Park and south of the park and ride is currently not in the green belt, but is proposed, but, but the York local plan is proposing to take it into the green belt um, it is quite clear it is white land in the neighbourhood plan. So it is our understanding uh, that this is the only land that is formally recognised as not green belt uh, that is made in the local plan. So it's, it's a, it's a one-off. Uh, but as such, the council's decision to put this land into the green belt would require the council to demonstrate the exceptional circumstances required by the 2012 MPPPF paragraph 83. So as a rejected site, we are uncertain that we will get a chance to discuss this site in any of the other sessions, and hence why we've, we just wanted to draw it to your attention today. Um, as such, we do not think this particular non-Greenbelt site cannot be placed into the Greenbelt without exceptional circumstances being demonstrated. And that's all that I uh, wish to, to say uh, today, but obviously if you need any, any clarification, by all means, say so. Thank you, Mr. Vernon. We are going to be considering green belt boundaries and the inner boundary in particular in some some detail at subsequent hearing sessions. So I, I, have, I have a feeling we might be coming back to that one. Uh, Mr. Henderson, was there anything you wanted to say about that now? So I will. I, I'm 
um, let me address address you on it now. Uh, the only thing that's caught me by surprise is the reference to the appeal decision. I'm I'm seeing that, so I might need to come back to you on that. Let let me let me give you the position as we understand it, and then see where that takes us. So the first thing to say is the neighbourhood plan, uh, which was made, uh, could not and did not purport to set the boundaries of the green belt. That's the first thing. What the neighbourhood plan did do, as one might expect, was to show the general extent of the green belt as it was understood at that time. And that was expressly said to be the case in the neighbourhood plan. The neighbourhood plan made express reference, and we might come back to you and give you these separately in writing, but it expressly said that it was only showing the general extent. Uh, it is correct that on the policies map for uh, that neighbourhood plan, the general extent as it's showing did not include the piece of land with which Mr Vernon is concerned. But the, the simple point is, it doesn't matter. You have a plan before you which is undertaking that boundary setting exercise. This is not a question needing to establish exceptional circumstances. What we are doing here is we're not simply showing the general extent, we are defining the precise boundaries. So this is a, a local plan which is doing a, a different role, performing a different role to that which was undertaken by the neighbourhood plan. There is, in, a, in my submission, no conflict between the two. Even if there was, section 38.5 would resolve that conflict for you. Uh, but we don't need to even get there because the neighbourhood plan didn't define the boundaries. It is the plan that you are examining which did that. Uh, as to the appeal decision, I've pulled it up uh, very quickly and have skimmed it. And I don't think that detracts in any way from the analysis that I have um, set out for you. Um, if the it, reason for, forgive me, Mr. If it if it assists, um, I, I'm about to um, put, uh, plead with uh, with my colleague um, to take a short break. Um, so that that might give you um, maybe 15 minutes, if 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 that might be sufficient for you to have a have a a little bit more than a very very brief skim at least. Well, um, I'm, I'm the, happy to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. That's no problem at all. Okay. Well. We'll we'll break now then. Have a have a look at it and then we'll come back. If you can all uh, mute and turn your cameras off so you don't leave the meeting or however you want to deal with it. I'll resume at eleven ten. Until then, everyone, thank you. Good morning, everyone. We're at eleven ten, so we can resume. Mr. Henderson, I was with you, wasn't I? Sir, so, so you were. Um if 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 it's permissible by you. Can I share my screen? And what, what I'll then do is I'll talk you through step by step the neighbourhood plan and then this appeal decision, if, if, if that's. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful. Go ahead. So, so what I, just bear with me, I'll load it up. You should now see my screen. So this there is the, is the neighbourhood plan. I'll take you to the plan first. It's page 16 of the neighbour plan. I'll zoom in to make it obvious what we're looking at. We're concerned with this area of land here, which is not not shaded in green. Green is the colour indicating the general extent of the green belt, but it falls within the neighbourhood plan area, which is the red line you see there. Now, that's the that's the plan that's been referred to by Mr Vernon. When we turn to the relevant policy, that's policy PNP1, and I've I put that on the screen there for you and that uh, says, as I've highlighted, the general extent of the York Greenbelt within the plan area is shown on the policies map. And I highlight the words general extent. This is not a plan that either could or did set Greenbelt boundaries. And if and insofar as there's any doubt about that, and in my submission there isn't, that's put to bed by the supporting text paragraphs 4.17 through to 4.110 and uh, I highlight the relevant parts for you. Paragraph 4.17, the MPPF is clear that the identification and modification of green belt boundaries are matters for the LPA to determine. In this case that authority is York City Council. Furthermore, these paragraphs, the MPPF identify that these processes should be undertaken as part of the preparation or review of a local plan 
In this case, this would be through the vehicle of the preparation of the emergency city of York local plan, which of course is what you have before you. Um, skipping ahead to 4.19, yeah, this is where the reference is uh, back to uh, the local plan draft. Uh, and then uh, the second sense, the effect of this process is that decisions on planning applications fall within the general extent of the Green Belt as defined in the RSSS, I stress that, are taken on the basis that land is treated in the Green Belt. 4.110, two sentences that I've hi highlighted. Uh, this will ensure that the preparation of the emerging local plan is used as the mechanism for the detailed identification of the York Green Belt boundaries in accordance with national policy. Final sentence, once the emerging local plan has been adopted, the neighbourhood plan will be reviewed in order to ensure the two elements of the development plan are consistent on this important matter. So very clearly, the neighbourhood plan did not and could not set Green Belt boundaries. It showed the general extent that excluded I fully accept on that policies map in the neighbourhood plan that excluded the piece of land that Mr Vernon is concerned with. But the straightforward position as today is we've undertaken that exercise, that exercise is before you, uh, and that piece of land is included within the green belt as the detailed boundaries we've now drawn show. Uh, we can come back to the specifics of that in the next phase, but that's where we are. The only point I therefore need to clear up is about the appeal decision. I'll put that on the screen. Uh, you will see, Hannah, let me zoom in so it's a little bit clearer. You'll see in the usual way, paragraph six, main issues. First first main issue, whether or not the appeal proposal is inappropriate development in the green belt. Uh, turn to paragraph seven, directly below that. That reference to the RSSS in the first uh, sentence. Second sentence is important here. The RSSS key diagram illustrates the general extent of the green belt but only, uh, but sorry, it does not determine what the detailed boundaries should be. These can only be set through the local plan, and this is currently in progress, but not yet complete. The appeal site falls within the Greenbelt shown on the proposals map. Uh, however, the plan has never been adopted, etc. Quite simply, everything the inspector said is entirely consistent with what I have shown you in the neighbourhood plan. The inspector was proceeded on precisely the same basis, namely that the detailed boundaries to be set by the local plan uh, which you are examining, it was not to be set, it could not be set by the neighbourhood plan. So we don't need to worry about exceptional circumstances or anything like that. If and in so far as Mr Vernon has comments about the precise drawing of the boundary in that area, we can return to those in, in phase three. But there's no uh, legal impediment, there's no change of approach required, there's no policy impediment to the, uh, to the plan as you have before you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, at that point, but I think that's pretty much everything I want to say on uh, on that, sir. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. I'll I'll come back to you, Mr. Vernon. But I would say before before doing that is that we are going to be looking at green belt boundaries in in a in detail in a subsequent hearing. So it might be that the best place to talk about this site is is then. But in the interest of fairness. If there's anything you want to say at this point, then I'm happy to hear from you. Uh, OK, thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a good um, suggestion. And I think that's that's an offer that I would propose to take up. Um, what what I would just say in res response to Mr. Hennessy is that um, I think it's understandable that they, the, the, the council um, does not accept the sites in the green belt to begin with. Um, and I understand the, 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 the good arguments he makes. However, the two things really. One, one is we're not in a straightforward situation because the, 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 the York Green Belt is a sort of a, is a mercurial situation. Mm -hmm. So it is correct that the that the local plan should define the Green Belt. But as, as I say, we're not in a straightforward situation where we're starting from scratch. Um, we, we, we're coming from a position where it's been a much more cloudy history to what is green belt and, and what is not. Um, how, however, the question that, that I really would put is, if that is the case, why on earth would, would this neighbourhood plan specifically choose to, to put a different piece of colour on that land? Um, it just doesn't it doesn't make sense 
And the only the only explanation that I the best explanation I've had is is, is from the parish council that explained to us that the uh, that they that they could, they were prevented from including that area of land as green, coloured green on the plan because of legal advice from the council that uh, that, that told them that the historical uh, York Green Belt boundary had never included that that area for ward reasons, and so that was the reason why it was um, it was it, it, that that specific action to exclude it was was taken. But uh, so thank you for that opportunity, and, and yes, if we can re re return to this and say discussion about green belt boundaries. I think that's uh, probably the best thing to do. Um, could I could I, could I ask the the the, 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 the extracts that were uh, displayed by Mr. Hennessy are um, circulated or, or circulated or adding, added to the uh, to the examination room? Um, the library, sorry, the examination library. I'm happy to do that. If if Mr. Henderson, you can yeah. pass them to the program officer at some point. Yes, sir. Leave I will. Um, I'll do that. We'll probably put in a, a short one page on front, in front of it to explain what they are and and uh, what they show. Um, but leave, think, leave that with me. We'll, yeah, we'll I think that would be helpful because then my colleague and I will have access to them as well easily. Yeah, we'll do that before we start the next phase, so that you've got right. those in front. Thank and thank you, Mr. Vernon. So can I just pick up then the other comment which was made by Mr Hancock on this matter? Um, yes, of course, carry on. Uh, essentially, the point is there is no hierarchy. Um, there isn't any hierarchy, he's absolutely correct, uh, but nor does there need to be a hierarchy. Instead, what we have adopted here is a bespoke approach for your reflecting the characteristics of your. Um, it is not, for example, uh, I, I draw a comparison with the East Riding, not that far away, a large rural area where a hierarchy might be appropriate. We've taken a different approach here. Um, I'll ask Ms. Cloud to, to talk you through that approach, but the headline submission is this is a bespoke, tailored approach to setting out the strategic development in the area. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay. Um, the spatial strategy is set out in section three of the plan with the section and the policies needing to be read as a whole rather than ind independently. Policy SS1 and the proposed modification in PM55 sets out the overall direction, key parameters and spatial principles to provide growth and the strategic approach with the strategic location of development done by the identification of strategic sites. So it's considered appropriate to use this approach improvements to a settlement hierarchy, given the compact nature of the authority and the key settlements within it. And the boundaries have been drawn to provide appropriate land for the required need and to allocate sufficient land to accommodate housing need beyond the plan period. So balancing all aspects, the approach is considered to be the most appropriate for York. Um, this approach provides clarity in delivering a sustainable approach and is considered to be clearer and more precise in identifying how and where development should occur in the long term. And so the only other point I think I then have to sweep up is the comments about the sustainability appraisal. Uh, I can do this um, quite shortly as Mr Lyon has took you through, through this aspect in quite some detail already. Um, the, the factors that have been referred to before before you today, heritage, transport, etc. All of those were considered, it's all documented. Uh, what we what we had was a judgment that was reached, taking all those matters into account. Um, Mr. Hancock and his colleagues there here in statement refers to or, or, or seeks to suggest that somehow there wasn't a balanced judgment. But of course, as you're well aware, a balanced judgment doesn't require each factor to be given equal weight. A balanced judgment requires those matters to be taken into account in the balance. That's precisely what council has done in some areas that will require greater weight to be given to heritage as, as opposed to other factors reflecting of course the very special and unique heritage of the city on which you've heard so much already what we say absolutely nothing to be concerned about there in terms of approach yourselves thank you mr henderson i'm going to move us on to matter five which was housing land supply Mr. Hancock, you you had a submission to make on this. Thank you, sir. Very sh very short one, really, uh, and that is to say that the windfall allowance uh, going up uh, is, is an unwelcome 
uh, introduction to the plan, uh, we would expect windfalls to fall uh, if a, a local plan is a successful plan, which brings forward allocations to meet local needs. Um, and then that that would suggest that there's going to be greater pressure, uh, potentially if those windfalls aren't um, experienced uh, at the later end of the plan period and greater need potentially for uh, further allocations or safeguarded land. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Um, Mr. Henderson, was there anything there that you wanted to address? We did talk about this at some length the other day, but I'm happy, we, we, happy we, to, we, to we, respond. We did, sir. Uh, I'll, I'll be really very brief. Um, the idea that windfall would uh, fall as a result of allocations, that's been taken into account, as you may recall, because we've only looked at the windfall arising from those sites which are so small that they're not part of the allocation process. So there's no double counting. We've expressly had regard to that fact to see the windfall paper. The second short response about uh, pressure at the end of the plan period, you would of course recall from the trajectory that Ms Bartle presented uh, during the main hearing session on this, there is uh, quite considerable flexibility at the end of the plan period and indeed extend and beyond, which is important for the Greenbelt permanent. Uh, so even if that concern is justified, uh, you, you have the answer there and it's in the trajectory before you. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. There, there's nobody wants to speak on matter six, which was, sorry, bear with me, infrastructure requirements, deliver, delivery and viability. But there are some submissions on matter seven. The matter seven was the approach to setting greenbelt boundaries. Mr. Hancock, you had something to say about this, and Mr. Vernon too, but I'll hear from Mr. Hancock first. Thank you, sir. Well, I, I suppose some of what I'm going to say has just been uh, rebutted there previously, uh, but we do believe that um, the plan needs to address uh, the requirement for safeguarded land so that the uh, uh, there won't be need to be green belt um, amendments again for a period well beyond the plan period. Uh, I note that the, the local plan says it, the green belt uh, boundaries are expected to last five years. We're, I'm not really convinced that constitutes well beyond when you have an opportunity particularly uh, to create a green belt uh, boundary from scratch, as York has done here. Um, we feel that uh, some of the approach to, to the boundaries themselves, uh, uh, your matter 7.2 is the land which is unnecessary to keep permanently open. Some of the boundaries follow uh, quite um, weak uh, features on the grounds that people's uh, erratic gardens, fences, uh, hedgerows, uh, um, they're not strong boundaries where you've got nearby strong road uh, boundaries which would create a firm uh, uh, edge to the built settlement uh, for years to come and a very defensible edge as well. Um, so I think that is all we'd want to say there. So take on board that there's going to be further sessions on the Greenbelt boundaries and we'll be able to uh, comment then on the boundary in the area that we're particularly interested. Yes, there will there will be further sessions when we talk talk through the green belt boundaries in detail. My colleague and I are scratching our heads about how we might go about that, but um, that's with us for now. Mr. Vernon, was there anything else you wanted to say on this matter? Um, I know. I think we, as we discussed earlier, we're going to pick it up under the yeah uh, the green belt, um, and well, yeah, just look for well. Uh, wait for further information on, on when that is, etc. Thank you. Yeah, that, that information will be out relatively soon, um, but it's with us at the moment. Good. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Hernan. Mr. Henderson, was there anything you, you wanted to say? So I'll, was... I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, it's back to the trajectory to answer the first point from Mr. Hancock. You will see that trajectory shows not only 
five years worth of supply beyond the fire plan period, so 2033, 34 onwards. But importantly, the final column, it's in grey on the A3 sheet we provided, headed post 2038, includes quite considerable supply there too. So I don't accept the criticism that, well, firstly, I don't accept the criticism that in principle you need to go beyond five years, but secondly, even if you do need to go beyond five years, well, we've done it. Um, and there's quite considerable supply showing the permanence and flexibility that's built in. That's the first point. Uh, the second point um, about whether boundaries are, are weak or defensible will leave over to any specific instances that want to be raised when we get to, to those. I'll, I'll, all I'll say now is uh, we have looked at that as a factor. Mr Linus has addressed you on, on that approach. I'm not going to repeat um, his submissions in that regard. Thank you, Mr Henderson. I didn't have anyone who wanted to speak on matter eight, so I think that covers everything we'd intended to cover this morning, unless there's unless there's anything anything else anyone wants to raise. In which case, thank you all. Um, and I'll draw this um, this part of the this virtual part of the hearings to a close. Good. Thank you. I'll leave thank the you meeting. Very much. Thank you.